Hi, everyone. Again, my name is Ellie Blaine, and I'll be talking about urban and small scale ag considerations. I am directing the new urban soil health program with the association, and I am incredibly excited about this opportunity and to start working with all of the districts around the state um, that work with urban and small scale growers or wish to in the future. So I'll go through some examples of urban and small scale ag, what we've seen and who we've worked with, and talk about how soil health practices can apply on small farms. I'll throw in a few other considerations, talk about needs we've heard from urban growers as well as conservation professionals, and then touch on the future of the urban soil health program. So just to kick things off as a reminder about soil health, uh, it is the continued capacity of soil to function as a vital living ecosystem that sustains plants, animals, and humans. And the four principles that really guide soil health practices in the field are to minimize disturbance, maximize soil cover, maximize biodiversity, and maximize continuous living roots. And these four principles are just as applicable on the small scale and urban scale as they are on a large farm. Um, however, often those practices and what it looks like is going to be de very different. You know, the, the tools and equipment needed to apply these principles and uh, really make it function, make the soil function in a soil health system are going to be different. So how do we accomplish this? and soil health benefits. Uh, I'm not gonna read through all of these, you're probably very familiar, but I just wanna emphasize how important soil health is to our farm's productivity, no matter what scale, um, you know, increasing aggregate stability, water infiltration, organic matter, um, helping to deal with weed and press, pest pressure. And so there's a, a growing movement towards soil health and uh, urban growers and small growers is who we're trying to reach with this program. So who are urban and small scale farmers? What do I mean when I'm talking about small scale agriculture? Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with working with these growers in, in your areas, but maybe not all of these types. Maybe you don't have all of these growers in your district. Um, but they may come or maybe they're there and your programs just aren't able to reach them right now. So we've worked with market farms, community gardens, church gardens, schools, nonprofits, um, inst institutional and commercial business farms, um, such as at a hospital or a university or a prison even, uh, demonstration and research gardens, such as master gardeners or extensions, gardens. Um, a lot of your soil and water districts have demonstration gardens there or work closely with master gardeners to operate a demo garden, backyard gardeners. And, you know, what are, what are these growers producing? Often they're producing on a small scale, which I consider, you know, about 20, under 20 or under 50 acres, but really often we see under 20, 10 acres, even less than an acre production, and mostly growing diverse vegetable crops, sometimes organically, and sometimes also mixing in perennial crops such as blueberries, nuts, fruit teas, and having an annual crop component as well. We see mixed vegetables and livestock, livestock being produced as well. And uh, there are more and more cut flower gardens too, where people are selling cut flowers to farmers markets or local distributors. So they, we can reach them with soil health as well. So I'll, I'll run through a lot of visuals of different growers that we've worked with. And just to give you an idea of whom we're looking for, how we're looking forward to working in your districts with, with similar growers. So the first one being market farms. This is from Indianapolis and they run um, their farm on less than an acre 
in a very intensive way where they're producing many vegetables, um, do a lot of season extension and are, are turning over production very quickly and providing a very high quality product to restaurants as well as to sell at local markets. What you can see here, um, you know, they, they do a year round market. There's a winter market here and you, you can really visualize the diversity of all the crops that they're growing here. And the group that runs that, they have um, quite extensive farming experience. You know, they've worked on other small farms. They've uh, done a lot of training to get their farm where it is today. And not all growers in the urban environment or on a small farm scale have that experience. So there's definitely a diversity in terms of the skills and knowledge base of the growers that we're working with. And I think that is one of the uh, complexities of working in the small and urban scale is that we, we need to meet those growers where they're at and it's a diverse audience uh, with a diverse skill set. This is another example of a market farm where the couple turned their backyard into a growing operation and similarly grow many diverse crops in their neighborhood. And here's another in a subdivision where the grower removed the sod, built up with mulch and turned, uh, turned their area, their backyard into a farm. Growing Places Indy is in Indianapolis and they run a network of farm sites. And they also operate a um, an apprenticeship program. So they're very involved in the community, again, growing food for market. Blue Yonder Organic Farm is located out in Hendricks County and is a 40 acre farm, which I still consider fitting into that small, small farm scale. Um, she has two high tunnels, they do livestock, uh, egg production, beekeeping, honey production, and you can't see it here, but there's a diverse vegetable area on the other side of their stream. And uh, she also does mushrooms. So many different crops being produced on, you know, large acreage, but pretty small footprint per um, crop that she is producing. And uh, she produces all organically. This is Sarah Creech who runs that farm. Uh, who is also a veteran and has a very interesting story for how she got into agriculture, which is always wonderful to explore with growers. Hideaway Farm doesn't currently exist any longer, but they were operating on an acre and you can see here doing diverse vegetable cropping systems, also all organically uh, using tarping, mulching, cover cropping, a lot of the soil health practices on their farm. And they were really engaged with the NRCS. They, uh, you know, had Jared Chu from Hendrix out often, and there's this really good knowledge share, I think, that can happen on a small farm whereby, you know, the grower is learning from uh, conservation professionals and vice versa, that we can learn okay, what in practice is happening at these, on these farms? Um, you know, how's it working with cover crops? And how do we trial more and more and use these growing operations as a, a test site, as they're able to do, uh, to, to learn more and then bring that knowledge elsewhere. And it's just a, a small family, you know, a husband and wife that are operating this, this farm. So, there's definitely a lot of competing needs and priorities, but uh, we see that a lot of these small and urban growers are very in tune with soil health already and see the importance and understand the value and just need help with the practices potentially. Worked with community gardens and they are a fantastic spot for demonstrations and very avid growers often that want to you know, learn more about how to grow food and how to produce food for themselves. This is a, a demonstration and a workshop we did here in Indy. 
And again, the growers are very diverse and um, this gentleman was a pleasure to work with, Levert Sharp, and was game for trying all sorts of cover crops in many different methods. And I know um, uh, he, he is no longer living, unfortunately, but he was one of the first to work, be worked with here with the Soil and Water Conservation District on a small farm scale. And to have those leaders that are willing to try something and willing to be creative and learn how to apply practices to a small farm scale is really important to find those people. We work with school gardens. This is an example of Big Green, which is an organization that creates uh, replicable school gardens to bring them closer to kids and also develop curriculum to work with teachers. And so they have been a great way to reach around 40 different schools and apply soil health practices on their sites. Paramount School is growing food and selling to you know, their community and to teachers and others. And this farm site really works well because they have a hired farm manager that's separate from the school system. So they're able to operate year round when you know, school isn't always in session and there isn't that labor uh, to really make a farm work. So it's a very successful model so that teachers and kids can engage on their own time and on their leisure um, and be exposed to a system that's functioning well. And they've also been a great site for demonstration and workshops. Here you can see the, the big green learning gardens there as well. And you can see how close this um, garden is to the school. So to be able to have those sites where we can partner and do workshops is an incredible resource. We work with nonprofit gardens. This is Indy Urban Acres, which I'm familiar with here in Indy, but I'm sure there's similar organizations around the state and they operate a few different sites and all of the produce is grown for donation through either food pantries or a free weekly CSA share. And it's also been a great demonstration site for soil health practices. This is an example of the produce grown and the flowers that are also being produced and grow, uh, donated as well. And they've been a great site for um, youth training and youth employment. They have a partnership with a, uh, a, a program to work with youth on uh, six weeks over the summer. So you may see that where there's youth being involved in a nonprofit garden. And I think that can just help us reach more minds and more people uh, to know how to use and implement soil health practices on the ground. Groundwork is another nonprofit that works with youth and does a lot of youth education, as well as uh, community development work and public greening around the city. They're a national organization with local chapters and have been very willing to try out different soil health gardening practices and educate others. And they can partner, right? They can partner with the nonprofit farms, par partner with the Soil and Water District. And here's an example of us implementing a program with them um, on a farm site to install native plants. They're led by a woman director who's incredibly passionate and engaged. And I just threw this in here because I, I think uh, Phyllis is a great example of a lot of the women that we see leading organizations, especially in the nonprofit field in urban settings. And it's, it's just wonderful to see and understand more of who and why um, these organizations are working. This is out at another farm site where we worked with women for the land, land to do a demonstration, a pollinator garden strip, and 
you'll start to see a theme of a lot of partnerships <laughs> coming into play. And we see that on a large farm scale for sure, but on the small farm, I think those networks are already often established. And from a soil and water district side or NRCS side, we can, uh, there's, a, there's a great opportunity to plug in and leverage those relationships. And here is Stephanie McLean from the NRCS helping to do a Women for the Land workshop at a local urban garden. We will also often work with restaurant gardens. I'm really not sure where all of you are coming from, but you may see restaurants that operate their own small garden, growing food to go into their restaurant. This restaurant also has a few different locations and one of them is right on a public uh, greenway where they have foot traffic and bicyclists. And in this photo, you, you can see uh, oat cover crops being used here around their production. And again, it's, it's in a very visible spot. So there's a lot of opportunity for signage and education and workshops to be done with minimal effort. And then a home and backyard gardens. This is from my backyard a couple of years ago and a relatively small space, right? This is only 10 by 13, but productive. Um, I like to, to mulch my garden and use cover crops in the winter as well. And you may most likely be working with a lot of rural growers that have a backyard garden alongside their commodity crop fields. Here in the city, there's a lot of urban revitalization work happening to turn vacant lots into gardens. And um, I just love this project. It's via a nonprofit here. And they started a new program called Go Growing Good in the Hood. And they're engaging the community in producing food to donate. And they also engage kids and really are about boosting the knowledge base in our youth. Uh, here is an example of them doing a soil test. And I just, I guess this is why I'm in it uh, for urban agriculture is I just see that there are so many opportunities to hit on multiple um, issues and multiple learning topics. We did a workshop uh, with with women and they you know brought all their kids and their grandkids out and I just love this as an another opportunity and an example of you know working with youth working with older folks and you'll see the kids really love to get engaged and uh, on the left there's a grandmother working with her grandson so a lot of opportunities for intergenerational work to happen um, all around growing food. This is a native plant installation. University gardens, you'll probably see this more frequently in our around education hubs. This is the farm at Butler and it's about an acre and they're growing food for market, but they also work with apprentices and interns from the university. And again, it's another example of where they have a hired farm manager uh, to run the operation. And, you know, depending on who you're working with, those, those farm managers are amazing people to work with and can, um, you know, implement and trial and practice soil health practices on their farms. You probably won't see a whole lot of rooftop gardens around the state, but here is one from Indy and it is in partnership with a hospital. I have seen other, you know, farm sites that are just on the same grounds as a hospital being, uh, being created. And often I think there are a lot of new programs to create a prescription based model where my doctors are actually prescribing vegetables, uh, especially for patients with diabetes. And we've seen that here in Indy. I know Purdue Extension is really involved in uh, trying to share that model and spread it around the state. 
So I'm, I'm curious if we'll continue to see more of this happening. And then of course, demonstration gardens. This is uh, demo boxes operated at the state fairgrounds out of Hendricks County. And they're a great place for signage as well as soil health practices. And Master Gardeners works there often. So we've done workshops bringing in and partnering with master gardeners and the community. This is uh, Kevin Allison's demonstration garden with the Marion SWCD and there are community plots all around. There's a lot of corn being grown and sorghum and he has uh, negotiated with the parks department such that they don't till his plots so he's able to operate it as a, a pretty fully functional soil health garden. And it's a great opportunity for signage. You can see the, the cover crops here in the winter where his plot is the only one that's green <laughs> throughout the year. And it's just a beautiful spot and a great case study area for us to practice soil health um, practices, crop rotations, cover crop mixes, and to also educate community members. Purdue Extension and their master gardeners have shown interest as well in trialing cover crops. This is at the state fairgrounds. So when you're there for the, the state fair, uh, you can see that cover crops are being grown and cut down and used in their system now. And they have integrated signage to educate the public about what they're doing. We also work with a number of church and faith-based gardens. This one has a great public sign for how many pounds of produce have been grown. And there, again, another example of where they have a part-time farm manager hired to operate their garden. And here is uh, the Indie Star coming out to interview them about their practices. And they've been very willing to trial soil health practices, cover cropping, mulching, no-till, as well. And uh, so it's another avenue to do more public outreach and really leverage that work is bringing out the media and having that being covered to get the word out. Again, another example of a church garden. And they started just a couple of years ago and are incredibly productive on a small, small scale. And it's been amazing to see how quickly that a location can turn around and make a productive site when they have good leadership. This just took one person that knew how to do community building and engage their congregation and the community in helping to make this site flourish. I've seen housing complexes start to establish raised beds and uh, growing food on their land. And it's a great opportunity to bring in youth, educate youth, and um, engaging where there are those opportunities as a conservation professional, I think, again, helps, helps to reach a broader audience. So I know I ran through those pretty quickly, but I just wanted to show some visuals of the diversity of urban and small farm growers that we're working with, that I've worked with. And I'm sure there are a thousand other examples out there and you have your own from working in your communities. Um, and all of these organizations, all of the individuals operating them, you know, have their own why, their own reasons for being in it and doing this work. And to me, I, I think it really centers often around community and food, but, uh, you know, teasing that out a bit further, you know, sometimes, it is just about livelihood, right? And, and making a living for oneself. Other times it's a nonprofit that's doing this work and they're really about youth education or skills building or um, you know, revitalizing neighborhoods. There's groups that are in it for self-sufficiency, others that really just wanna grow better, healthier produce and make that available. So a lot of reasons to be in it. And I think as uh, conservation professionals, as folks working with these growers, it's 
especially in this environment, um, it's important to take the time to understand why growers are, are in this and how we can best support them um, because that will, will help guide their priorities. So I want to go through some soil health practices and just touch on a few examples of those uh, these principles being applied in practice on an urban and small scale. All of the NRCS soil health management systems uh, practices uh, can apply on a small scale, including crop rotation, cover cropping, no-till, reduced till, mulching, nutrient management, and pest management. And I'd say I probably have mostly worked, um, I've worked with all of these topics, but often the, the practices that we see most effective to getting people starting out are cover cropping, um, as well as no-till or at least reducing tillage. So I threw in the practice codes, the NRCS practice codes here, just to remind myself and us that um, all of these practices are, are based on standards that they've developed and can be applied um, you know, in the urban environment and are important to consider when an urban or small farm grower goes to apply for an NRCS program. So on crop rotation, you know, on an urban scale, we see a lot of different crops being grown in a very small area. Here is about four different crops with kale on the top. And then you have cilantro being grown with collards and arugula over here. And that's probably in a 10 foot span or so. So a lot of the urban and small growers, I think are naturally practicing crop rotation and crop diversity, but uh, there are a lot of resources that we can help with. The Crop Rotation on Organic Farm Manual from Sayer is a great resource I found to, you know, talk more about guidance for crop rotation. And I acknowledge, and I know that not all of our growers are going to be in an organic system. However, I think a lot of the principles and practices of rotation still apply. And through in the calendar here, just to show that, again, a lot of these growers are working with 30, 40 different crops in a, in a season. So the, the environment is complex, but uh, rotation is typically happening more than you'd see on a large, uh, large farm scale. And then cover crops. So mostly we've seen fall planted cover crops going into spring, but uh, I've definitely started to work more with summer cover crops too. And I'll run through some of those. Here you can see uh, cereal rye being grown on raised beds. So just a reminder for all of us that, you know, these are plants that can be planted and thrive no matter the scale, no matter the situation. And there are also a lot of resources out there, such as managing cover crops profitably that has more information about each cover crop and their growing environments and their traits. NRCS just came out with a new seeding uh, windows table for cover crops here in Indiana, which goes into more specificity than previously. And um, this has been really helpful in guiding small growers to uh, establishing cover crops. And we've seen small farmers using both winter kill and winter survival cover crops and usually tailoring that along with their crop rotation. So here you can see on the, the right here in the front, um, a winter kill species, likely it was oats, and then uh, it looks like they did some additional mulch. And then we have cereal rye here over on the left, which is a overwintered cover crop. And just another example where you have half of a raised bed using a winter kill species on the left, and then a winter survival mix with cereal rye and hairy vetch on the right. So each side of that raised bed is going to be planted with a different crop. And 
seeding cover crafts, right? How do we get it? How do we get these established on a small scale? It's going to look very different than you would for, you know, corner beans. Uh, mostly we seed cover crafts by hand or, you know, via broadcasting. And then raking them in, kind of fluffing them in. And, you know, there's, there's more to it. <laughs> uh, definitely need to make sure you have a stale seed bed and, you know, it's pretty weed free, but uh, this can be done, is being done on either a, you know, entire row um, or, you know, a few different cover crops on in different rows. And uh, here you can use some tools. This is a seeder that would usually be used for, for production crops that's being used to establish a cover crop. And these are, again, mostly planted in the fall. A couple of examples are a cereal, rye and radish mix, and then oats. And they, again, can be done on multiple rows together. This is post-harvest where the grower used a winter kill mix of oats and peas and radish. So all of those will winter kill. And they broadcast seeded them and then incorporated them into all of those crop beds, likely at the same time after harvest. So what are some different species that we've seen commonly used and what are some common mixes? I've most often worked with oats, cereal rye, hairy vetch, and crimson clover, and then use those in mixes, um, or use them individually. And there's definitely a lot more cover crops out there, but I think one of the key differences on the small scale, depending if you're working with an organic grower or one that is um, using synthetic chemicals, is that you will likely be working with less in a mix, in a cover crop mix, than you would be on a large field where you might have 15 different species in a mix here we'd often see, you know, maybe a maximum of three or four. And I think there's definitely an importance to uh, ramping up diversity of those cover crop mixes on the small farm scale. But I definitely, I, I guide growers to start small, start easy, start with things and, and get familiar with the species so that they know how to manage them well. Oats is a winter kill species. And the first one that I go to when working with a, a grower that's new to cover cropping, it's uh, kind of a, a low risk situation where it will winter kill and you can plant almost anything after it. We have hairy vetch as well, which I know probably will give you some concern and some pause uh, from working in a larger farm setting. It, I definitely think that there's a, a place for it in the small scale and, um, you know, in that scale, it can be easily managed and make sure that it doesn't go to seed and doesn't get out of control. And it's a, a great legume crop to use prior to summer transplants. And similar with crimson clover, just a beautiful cover crop that can be used prior to um, more of your summer transplants typically. And if let go to flower, really gives an opportunity for pollinators. Cereal rye we see used most often uh, rather than annual rye. And um, it is easier to kill <laughs> in a small farm setting and um, really good to use to establish a lot of uh, mulch, like a living mulch that you can use as a, as a mulch before transplants. And usually an overwintered crop similar to other rye really gives an opportunity for a late uh, cover crop that you can get in in winter before um, or post harvest. And then some mixes, we see oats and creams and clover being used often or oats and hairy vetch to add a legume to the mix. So you can use your oats as a you know, weed suppressor for the fall and then the, the slower growing 
legumes take over in the spring to provide that biomass and a nitrogen fixation prior to your next crop. And I've used crimson clover in walkways too, where you might not want, um, you might not feel like you can manage those mixes on the top of the bed. Uh, this, this is rye, cereal rye, and then a walkway of crimson clover, which I just find really beautiful too. And also help benefit pollinators if let flower. Here's a winter kill mix, oats, fields, peas, and daikon radish, where the field peas are helping to fix nitrogen, the radish being used to help break up compaction. And um, we've seen growers actually integrating these into their garlic rows, um, which provides a really nice mulch and um, helps boost biology for the garlic. And Many growers are using uh, mixes and different mixes in each individual row and basing that off of their crop rotation and planning ahead for what next crop will go, go in. See a summer cover crop mix here with sun hemp, sorghum sedan, and then the oats, field peas, and radish on the right. So how do you manage these cover crops? How do you terminate? Uh, this is what you might see on a large scale with vetch, um, you know, and being planted into a, a vetch that's been flail mode or crimped. And the same can happen on a small scale, just with different tools. So weed whackers, great go-to for <laughs> getting hairy vetch chopped down. You can also use a sickle or a scythe um, and either on a raised bed or or just a, an in-ground bed. And here you can see where half of the bed has been chopped down um, and it's at flower, rye, and hairy vetch. And it's a pretty successful way. You might see some regrowth. There's different ways to manage that. And, um, you know, on a, a larger small scale, you may be using a, a tractor or a flail mower or roller crimper to get those cover crops down. Here's an example of a BCS attachment or an attachment to a BCS machine, which is for flail mowing. And so you can see on the right, the rye, the cereal rye that's been chopped down. And another method is to tarp after this was this weed whacked down, rye and vetch weed whack down, and then a tarp to cover it for a couple of weeks to just make sure that there's no weed growth, but still have the benefits of those living roots and the above ground mass. You're probably familiar with uh, using a roller crimper in an organic situation on a large farm field prior to soybeans. And the same can be done in a veggie system whereby uh, this rye was actually hand crimped. It was a very small scale. So it could be crimped by hand, then tarped, and uh, have your zucchini planted right into that mulch. And so how do we establish some of these cover crops? Um, or how do we plant our crops into these established cover crops? Um, we'll have, you know, hairy vetch being used here and it can be cut down in the spring. This grower actually used that biomass in between the rows where she was going to be planting her seeds. This is oats that has died and then the lettuce just planted right into that residue. And you may also see transplants going into that residue. Hairy vetch was used um, here to be grown and then just used as a living green mulch around tomato transplants. A little bit hard to see, but that vetch mulch will decompose and help with, um, you know, water storage and, you know, help be a mulch throughout the season. And you see the same with cereal rye to tomatoes over here and then a hairy vetch cut down crop to peppers. This is a demo garden where you'll see um, the same thing happening prior to diverse vegetables. And you may also see cover crops being used throughout the summer. This is a sorghum sedan grass that's being used to shade 
cilantro throughout the summer. And then mulching. See mulching being used, straw mulch in high tunnels, in walkways and around crops or around individual crops like this lettuce really helps keep the, the leaves clean as well. And we've started to see using a paper mulch to create an added weed barrier prior to adding hay or straw on top. And we've seen both straw and hay mulch being used, often hay that is uh, legume based like an alfalfa. And nutrient management, very important component of this work. Uh, we recommend that all of our growers do frequent soil testing and on a you know small garden bed, it could there's a lot that goes into considering where to test, but it could either be an individual bed or a group of beds to get an average of an entire plot. And a lot of the growers are using amendments. Um, here you'll see an example of organic amendments that are being used either here as a fertilizer. Um, gypsum and then sulfur to help lower pH or adjust pH. And uh, definitely a lot of growers are going to be using synthetic chemicals as well. And I still have more to, to learn on, you know, how to help guide growers on nutrient management and soil testing on their farm. Um, just to mention that, oh, that soil biology plays a foundational role in nutrient management and unlocking nutrients in the soil to be accessible to plants. We have helped growers with establishing native and targeted plantings really to bring in beneficial insects and pollinators. And an example from Marion County's soil and water demo bed uh, is this beautiful field of about 10 different species of natives that grow year round and help to bring in natural enemies and help with pest management on the field. A new practice standard that I still have more to learn on is about soil carbon amendment. It's just recently been adopted, but we'll, we'll see how we can use that to help apply and guide growers to apply uh, carbon, compost, biochar, et cetera, on the small scale. And then, Tools and equipment. I know I'm getting close to time here, but I want to go through this just briefly um, and then I'll skip ahead a little bit. There's mostly manual tools that are being used. Um, you know, on a larger farm scale, you may see, you know, tractors, larger small farm scale, you may see, you know, tractors and others, other larger equipment being used. But what I'm mostly familiar with is, you know, a lot of hand tools to do bed prep, you'll see tillers or BCS being used. With the BCS, you can do attachments that are going to be more of a shallow till. And, you know, for seeding and transplanting, similarly, you'll see, um, you know, manual tools and there's a lot of different methods to get your seeds in the ground. And so, you know, start learning about these different tools because it will help us guide growers um, understanding how their methods for getting seeds in the ground and how do we integrate soil health practices, cover cropping, et cetera, with those practices. And you know, for cultivation, we see many different tools being used, such as wheel hose, tine weeders, a lot of hand weeding happening, uh, stirrupose. So there's a lot more tools here as well, but I'm going to kind of skip ahead and I'll make this, um, make this presentation available to everybody afterwards as well, so you can have more slides. But just a reminder that there's a lot of complexity in the tools that are being used on this scale. And um, it takes a lot of education work on our end to be able to work with these growers. So a couple of considerations on organic systems. I'm mostly familiar working with growers in the urban environment that are growing organically, if not certified. 
and you know pest management becomes a big consideration. Um, here we have many different pests, right, that want to eat our veggies as well. Um, proactive scouting in an organic setting is really critical, as is bringing in natural enemies and beneficial insects. You can see a parasitized tomato hornworm here. And there are, you know, organic certified pesticide sprays that can be used on an organic farm. We also have, see a lot of cultural and physical controls that can be used to um, help manage weeds, such as terping. And then using cover crop termination via a biological method where the plant is at flower is a common cultural and cultural control that growers are taking on um, in order to terminate and then also using organic amendments. So I'm going to also skip, unfortunately, um, past contamination because that is a big topic and maybe we can revisit that at another time or please be in touch with me to talk about contamination in an urban farm setting. Lead is the most common toxin or heavy metal toxin per that's persistent in a lot of urban soils that um, we need to consider when working with growers. There's a lot of fear out there and I want to be sure that there are, that we're all equipped, right, with the tools to help educate growers on how and when it's still safe to grow vegetables in a contaminated area. So please reach out to me, we can talk further about that. And in terms of needs, what are we seeing? What am I hearing that is needed from both growers as well as conservation professionals? So there's a lot of needs out there. I think that's why this program was established. We, you know, I'm hearing that growers really want more tools and resources for cover cropping mixes. You know, what are the rates to use, how to terminate, how to do that in an organic setting or at least a small scale setting. What are some common crop rotations integrated with cover crops that they can do? How to interpret soil tests, how to manage their nutrients and manage amendments based on those soil tests. And then working with contamination as well. There's a lot of uh, things to consider, and every contaminant is different. Um, again, lead is the most common one that we work with, or C being a, an issue. And then what programs are available? You know, growers don't have as much access, especially in the urban and small farm arena, to understanding what NRCS programs are out there, or even SWCD programs, extension offerings, so there's a great opportunity to provide more workshops, um, you know, continue to leverage partnerships and work together with growers because they do have a lot of experience. And um, I, I think I'm constantly reminded how much growers know and how much we can, you know, really listen and uh, collaborate to come up with creative practices for soil health systems on the small farm. And then on the conservation professional side, we see, you know, train the trainer workshops, um, that there's a big need for that. So our program will help with creating more opportunities like this to train conservation professionals and, you know, creation of grower focused resources. So some of the ones that I just listed, how can we work together? How can our program help create more of those resources to reach growers specifically and urban and small farm growers specifically. And then, you know, other partnerships. How do we work together more effectively amongst conservation organizations to reach the needs of growers? And I know there's a lot of competing uh, priorities and um, your time is very valuable. And, you know, often our agencies don't have the staff time necessary to reach everybody. So, um, 
you know, we're here to help work with you to create those partnerships and, and leverage our time in the best way possible. So just quickly, what is the Urban Soil Health Program? It is a five-year, um, it was created through a five-year contribution agreement between the association and the, and the NRCS. And we're focused on working with all the growers I just mentioned. It is modeled off a lot of urban agreements that are already happening around the state, um, such as the Warwick County Agreement, Marion County, uh, Allen County, and then work that you've all been doing already around your districts with urban and small farm growers. And our primary goals are to establish local working groups whereby partnerships um, or conservation agencies will partner with growers and nonprofits, other organizations, the public, anyone that's interested and engaged in this arena to um, you know, to access and provide more resources to growers. And there's funding mechanisms to provide four primary things, which include site visits, technical assistance, educational workshops, and educational materials. So we have four, oh, we have four regional staff uh, three of whom are hired through the association in the Northwest, the Northeast, and the Southeast. And then Holly McCutcheon is continuing in her role in the Southwest to cover that region. And um, please contact us. This will be available again for you all. And our website is on the, um, the district, sorry, the association page as well. There's a urban page there where you can find out more information, find our contact info. And I just really look forward to getting in touch with you all and growers in your area. And on that site, you can find a contact form um, and fill that out if you're interested in staying in touch or being part of a local working group. And then we have a few upcoming outreach opportunities I'll just highlight that the 28th and 29th of this month, we'll be doing meet and greet sessions where you can meet all of our staff, meet me again, and find out even more about uh, the depth of this program and how to be involved, ask your questions, and let us know what's already happening in your areas. So I know I'm cutting it a little bit short for questions and ran through some of that pretty quickly, but uh, let's, let's open it up for questions. Please get in touch with me and I'll, I'll also make sure that we share a PDF of this whole sh slideshow. So anything I missed will come to you still. So um, Ellie, there is a question in the chat box if you can see that and want to read it uh, from Angie. Yeah, let me just minimize this. And I can read it to you too, if you want. Actually, we probably should read it out loud for the uh, recording. Absolutely. So from Angie, even though there is a lot of partnership in terms of technical assistance, I'm assuming that the SWCDs are still the primary organization that is doing individual site visits. Is that correct? That is mostly correct. Um, the is our role and our responsibility for our local staff to help train local working groups once they're established. And those local working groups can be comprised of a number of partners that I just mentioned and pu the public. So there is opportunity um, and an expectation, I would say that those partners are also engaged in all of those uh, four mechanisms of reaching growers. So. They may be the primaries in doing site visits, but we'll, we'll help train up other partners to do site visits as well. And we're coming up with templates for, you know, what is that expectation for those site visits? And it'll also be up to the working groups to um, 
you know, to, to continue to help that training go forward. If I have a local gardener here asking questions about cover crops um, and soil health practices in her garden, can I direct her towards the Northwest specialist? Absolutely, yes. Um, in the Northwest is Marianne Rodriguez Soto. So reach out to her and, um, you know, if you can include me as well, probably at the outset, because we're still getting our technical resources and our own internal training up and going. We've been working on that hard this past month or so, but uh, we'll definitely want multiple minds on it. So yeah, reach out to Marianne. I'll share the contact form as well for our website. And that's a, that's a good way to be in touch. Uh, we'll, we'll reach out to anybody that's filled out that form.